to the throne of grace, challenge you with the wisdom to be found in the book of Proverbs. This wisdom, uh, as you will see, I pray, is going to challenge your heart uh, and challenge you to, uh, to seek this wisdom with all your heart. Uh, some quick background as we jump into this on the book of Proverbs. Um, like Psalms, um, Proverbs actually names a few uh, multiple authors of uh, various sections of the book. We know that Solomon wrote a, a large portion of the book of Proverbs, but uh, later in the book, we also read of um, a couple of other authors. Um, chapter 30, uh, a gentleman by the name of Augur, uh, we're told, wrote that one. And then chapter 31 was uh, Lemuel, uh, wrote that one. And then there's there's uh, some ambiguity on a couple of the chapters. But Solomon, as I mentioned, primarily wrote the majority of it. Um, he was uniquely qualified to do this. We know from First Kings that Solomon asked God for wisdom. He asked God for wisdom, uh, and God granted him that wisdom. We know that also from the book of First Kings, and we also know that that uh, Solomon was a very prolific writer. Uh, many many songs and proverbs were written by him. He actually wrote books on biology and zoology and several different fields. Um, and we know that people came from all over, uh, all over the world, to sit and hear his wisdom. And so this morning we are going to uh, sit or stand and hear the wisdom that comes from Solomon. I do want to point you to First Kings. Okay, uh, as hold on to Proverbs one. Uh, that's really where we're going to be, but it's First Kings 4.32, where it says, he spoke, this is speaking of uh, Solomon, he spoke 3,000 Proverbs and his songs numbered 1,005. He spoke about plant life from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of walls. He also spoke about animals and birds, reptiles and fish. From all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. So that is the wisdom we seek this morning together. Proverbs chapter one. A um, little bit more background. Uh, writing of the book of Proverbs, since Solomon wrote the majority of it, uh, he died in 931 BC. Uh, the evidence of some of the latter chapters uh, being compiled maybe written by Solomon, but, but uh, compiled by someone later, uh, as well as those last few chapters I mentioned, pretty much agreed that um, it was finished being put together as a single book by 686 BC. Um, and then I wanna mention that, that the book of Proverbs is considered a wisdom book from the Bible. And there's a handful of them, Job, Psalms, uh, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the songs of Solomon all fall into this grouping known as the wisdom books. And uh, one other side, there happens to be 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. So if you have never done this, I wanna challenge you with uh, March just around the corner, uh, read a proverb every day for the entire month of March. Um, uh, that's a challenge I'll leave with you. Um, as far as the purpose of the book, why was it written? Um, it is a series of very short instructions for living an effective life on earth. Uh, it states uh, in Proverbs 1-7, which we're going to cover today quite extensively, uh, really the, the theme of the entire book, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Um, only then will we discover knowledge and wisdom is when we fear the Lord. Uh, Solomon hoped that his reader would obtain practical, practical righteousness in all things and that we would do this by living our lives under the authority and direction of God. He specifically explained um, his focus that uh, it would that this fear of the Lord would impact every every facet of our life. Um, 
So we're going to jump into it uh, and go ahead and read the entire chapter. Um, I'm going to focus on uh, verses 1 through 23, but we'll read the whole chapter as we get started. I have titled this message, Seek Wisdom, and it'll be very clear why as we get into this chapter. So uh, Proverbs chapter 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. For gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Verse 8, listen, my son, to your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They are a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. My son, if sinful men entice you, do not give in to them. If they say, come along with us, let's lie in wait for innocent blood. Let's ambush some harmless soul. Let's swallow them alive like the grave and whole like those who go down to the pit. We will get all sorts of valuable things and fill our house with plunder. Cast lots with us. We will all share the loot. My son, do not go along with them. Do not set foot on their paths, for their feet rush into evil. They are swift to shed blood. How useless to spread a net where every bird can see it. These men lie in wait for their own blood. They ambush only themselves. Such are the paths of all who go after ill-gotten gain. It takes away the life of those who get it. Out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the public square. On top of the wall, she cries out at the city gate. She makes her speech. How long will you who are simple love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? Repent at my rebuke. Then I will pour out my thoughts to you. I will make known to you my teachings. But since you refuse to listen, when I call and no one pays attention when I stretch out my hand, since you disregard all my advice and do not accept my rebuke, I in turn will laugh when disaster strikes you. I will mock when calamity overtakes you. When calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble overwhelm you, then they will call to me, but I will not answer. They will look for me, but will not find me. Since they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord, since they would not accept my advice and spurned my rebuke, they will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. For the waywardness of the simple will kill them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, started reading the book of Proverbs in my daily devotions a couple of weeks ago, and it just struck me, particularly uh, a couple of verses out of this passage, um, of, uh, of really the expression of where the world is headed, where we are going, and the fact that we do not seek true wisdom, uh, as the Bible uh, talks about it. Um, let's jump into it. Proverbs 1, the first couple of verses, 1 and 2, uh, really start, starts off with a discussion. Uh, obviously, it tells us Solomon, son of David, wrote it. That's verse 1. But verse 2 uh, makes it clear the, the purpose of the book is to direct the reader to wisdom. It says in verse 2, the gaining of wisdom and instruction. The gaining of wisdom and instruction. So I thought it might be good if we understood what do we mean by wisdom? What do we mean by wisdom? See, well, knowledge, knowledge is facts and information acquired by a person through experience or education. It can be very theoretical. Um, could be practical understanding of a subject, but wisdom, wisdom goes much deeper than simply knowledge. Wisdom 
is good judgment to act upon information and facts. Uh, it's the correct application of knowledge. It's knowing what to do with what you know. And wisdom is that extra step of, uh, of acting accordingly. Um, knowledge can tell one how a financial system works, but it's wisdom that allows someone to actually manage a budget properly. I used to live in a place called Ridgecrest, California. Um, I spent 10 years there um, as a junior high and a high school teacher. Uh, Ridgecrest, California, middle of the high desert, north of Los Angeles, east of Bakersfield, um, about an hour from Death Valley. Okay? Ridgecrest has the, uh, a, a premier a naval research and development facility known as China Lake Naval Weapons Center. At, uh, at one time, it had, uh, Ridgecrest itself had the highest concentration of earned doctorates in the world. Um, it's only a town of about 28,000 people, small town uh, when I lived there, but uh, the amount of knowledge that was contained in this community was astounding. These are people that developed Sidewinder missiles and would test all of the military ordnance before it actually was used by the military. I got to, I knew people uh, in church that actually were test pilots for things like the Osprey, the vertical takeoff uh, rotary blade airplane that is now in use in the military. Um, uh, I actually got to see the stealth fighter uh, six months before anyone knew it existed, before it went public. I remember walking out of the school I was teaching at one day and in the horizon, uh, in the evening, I saw these two planes flying in the distance and um, just that very unique, all black, uh, very sharp lines and that, that, that V uh, tail on it, very distinct. And I can do very distinctly remember saying to myself, what is that? I have never seen that plane before. I didn't think anything of it. Uh, a few minutes later, you know, got my car, headed home. And then six months later, it hit the news that, that the United States has these, these super top secret stealth fighters. And I had to I thought back, I saw that. I saw that six months ago. Um, anyway, this was a place I lived, Ridgecrest, California. A, a lot of very smart people who couldn't match their socks or understand how to transfer the knowledge they had into everyday living. It was, it was the most bizarre thing I experienced. It took me a while to, to really understand that, that knowledge is not the same thing as wisdom. Just because you know stuff doesn't make you wise. I think this is lost in today's world. And far too many of us have way more knowledge than we ever use or really even need. People, it's time we learn how to apply the knowledge using godly principles. It's time that we seek wisdom. Proverbs teaches wisdom uh, through these short, uh, short principles and points that it makes. Okay, they shouldn't be regarded necessarily as laws or even universal prom uh, promises, okay? but, but there is wisdom to be held through these words. Um, Verses two through six um, really speak about the superiority of wisdom, the superiority of wisdom. So on that point, knowledge, as I said, is very pervasive right now in culture. Most of us can sit down at a computer and we could have the knowledge of the entire world right at our fingertips, but that does not make one wise. That does not make one wise. Pastor Warren Wiersbe, Stated, we, we are living in the information age, but we certainly aren't living in the age of wisdom. Many people who are wizards with their computers seem to be amateurs when it comes to making success out of their lives. How many of you have seen this to be true? We know some very smart people who make very dumb choices. We have the wisdom of the world right at our fingertips, and yet we can't figure out how to live a successful life. Why is that? Why is that? Proverbs has an answer for that. Um, 
Proverbs 1, verse 3. Um, it says, uh, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right, just, and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple. To give prudence to those who are simple. Uh, the simple one in scripture is the one who is uneducated, who needs instruction. Uh, the wisdom of this book, uh, it says, will make the young, the inexperienced one know what to do and how to do it in life. It gives the young man knowledge and discretion. In Proverbs 14, 15, it says, it says it this way, the simple believe anything, but the prudent give thought to their steps. Um, the one who is, who is uh, simple uh, in scripture is the one who is very gullible. They listen and follow anything. Proverbs is saying you need to gain wisdom so you can stop following just anybody. You can stop being gullible. Look at verse five. It says, let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance. The book of Proverbs is not only for the simple and the inexperienced, those who, who uh, lack, um, uh, lack training, but it is also for the one who is wise. You see that right there in verse five? Let the wise listen and add to their learning. Even the wise man can find help and guidance if they will only listen to the truth of scripture. Um, in verse six, it tells us for, the, for understanding Proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. People, Proverbs can help us to solve difficult problems and even the riddles of life that we find ourselves facing. Now, people, there is superiority in seeking and finding wisdom. And in verse 7, it tells us exactly where we should turn. Okay? The foundation of all wisdom, right here in verse 7, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of wisdom. Um, people, the book of Proverbs is, is more focused on pra practical life wisdom more than theological ideas. Yet, um, this verse, this passage right here is a vital theological principle that we must grab onto. The true knowledge and wisdom flows from the fear of the Lord. True knowledge and wisdom comes from God. The fear of the Lord. Um, fear, uh, this fear is the beginning or basis of wisdom because wisdom is conceived as a gift from God. And the surest way to get it is to ask God. James 1.5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. It will be given to you. Um, this fear of the Lord, people understand that it is not, uh, when we say the word fear, you know, a lot of us think of, of someone who's, who's scared or, or cowering in fear because they've been intimidated. That's not what this is speaking about. The fear of the Lord, um, is not cowering. It's the proper reverence that we owe our creator that we owe our Redeemer, our Savior. Um, it is the proper respect, an honoring of God. That's what it means by fear of the Lord. Do we approach the throne, throne of grace, recognizing the sovereignty of God? Or have we bought into this view of God as being, God's my co-pilot, okay? God's my buddy, my friend. Yes, God can be that. But we're talking about the creator of the universe. Okay? The being that spoke the world into existence, that is pre-existent before all time and space. Do we approach God like that? Do we understand how so far beyond who we are, that is God? Um, God should be regarded with respect, reverence, and awe. This is the attitude we should have towards the creator. 
It is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom when we can come to God in this regard. Wisdom cannot advance further until this starting point is established. See, well, it's not just this verse in Proverbs that states this. We see this same theme multiple places in the Bible. Job 28, 28 says, And he said to the human race, The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to shun evil is understanding. Psalm 111, 10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Well, this concept of, of fear of the Lord being the beginning, know that, that, that it's a reference to a controlling principle, the foundation, if you will. The foundation, it's not a stage you need to move through as in the first stage or the beginning. It is the foundational principle to what it means to find wisdom and knowledge. It is the fear of the Lord. Ecclesiastes 12.13 says, Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. To fear God, people, is both the beginning of wisdom and the conclusion. Here in Ecclesiastes, it tells us, it is the beginning and the end. It is all inclusive. It is the foundation that we must build on. Uh, fear of God is, is the foundation of wisdom, and it's found in God. But people, when we move away from God, it leads to bad choices and stupid mistakes. When we move away from the things of God, we start to believe the lies of Satan. We start to think that Satan's lies are truth. There's no easier place to see this than Genesis 3, 6. Turn to Genesis. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Evil, when we take our eyes off of God, we start to believe the lies from the world. It's that simple. When we stop fearing the Lord, when we take our eyes off of God, worldly truth begins to creep into our lives. Evil becomes justified. Truth becomes relative. Wrong becomes right. You don't believe me? Just look at what's going on in our nation right now. In June, this happened in California. Governor Gavin Newsom signed Senate Bill 357 into law. The bill was sponsored by State Senator Scott Weiner of San Francisco. It, um, it decriminalizes loitering with the intent to engage in prostitution. Went into effect January 1 of this year, uh, a little, not even two months ago. And already, already the results are in. Already the results are in. There has been an explosion in many California cities. Um, of blatant prostitution being conducted on city streets, particularly uh, in San Francisco. It's led to, a, and now it has led to a call, not to stricter laws, but to actual full legalization of prostitution. On February 8th, uh, Supervisor Hillary um, Ronan's legislative aide has been quoted as saying, we have tried many laws, federal laws, state laws, it just keeps chasing the problem around. So what we're hoping and trying to do is advocate for our state lawmakers to really address this issue and to legalize it. See, well, why do we have a culture that has gone off the rails when it comes to, to, to things like this? Very simple. We no longer fear the Lord. We no longer give God the, the honor and the respect that he deserves. We no longer recognize him as an authority in our lives and in this world. Is it any wonder that garbage like this can, can become part of the discussion, part of our culture? See, why do we have this, uh, this explosion? in, in uh, confusion about gender. 
Why are young people struggling with gender identity? Because we have forgotten or worse yet, we ignore that God created man in his image. Male and female, he created them. Look at Genesis 127. Genesis 127. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. People, why are we struggling in this country to find people to fill jobs? And I don't know about where you live, but where I live, it seems like every business establishment has a sign that says we're hiring. Why is that? Maybe it's because some in our leadership in our country has decided it would be a good idea just to hand out money for the last few years. Just give people money. People, they forgot the words of 2 Thessalonians 3.10. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. People, Scripture teaches about personal responsibility. Uh, Verses like Ezekiel 18, 20, and verse 30, Matthew 12, 37, John 9, 41, and 15, 22 through 24, and 1 Corinthians 3 all speak about personal responsibility. But we ignore the Bible and and, and claim that it is old-fashioned. It's no longer relevant. So now we have DAs who no longer persecute criminals for what they do. We don't hold individuals accountable for their actions. We simply let people off when they commit crimes. We now claim that the one committing the crime is just a victim themselves and its culture or its society or it's the law that is at fault, but it's not the individual. People, the Bible tells us that we have this thing called personal responsibility for our actions. Ladies and gentlemen, Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but the fool despises wisdom and instruction. This country has become foolish. When you remove the foundation of a building, ladies and gentlemen, the building falls. It's that simple. We as a society are in the process of removing the foundation of our culture. We are removing God from as many places as we can. We have removed God's word. We are removing God's truth. We are removing God's principle. Is it any wonder that culture is crumbling? People, until we get back to the understanding that all truth, all knowledge, all wisdom comes from God, his word. Through the power of his Holy Spirit, this country, this world is doomed to continue its path of self-destruction. People, we must return to God. We must return to godly principles. I don't care about how archaic you may think it is or how old-fashioned or out of date. God's truth never changes and never grows old. It is the one standard by which we must measure everything. Look at uh, Proverbs 1, 8, and 9. Proverbs 1, 8, and 9. People, in Proverbs 1, 8, and 9, Solomon moves on to invite the reader to receive wisdom, to embrace godly values. Look at verse 8 and 9. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction. Do not forsake your mother's teaching. People, Solomon invites the listener to receive wisdom as a child receives instruction from their mother and father. It's interesting to note that Solomon recognizes the role of both the mother and the father in, instill, in the installation of godly principles upon the children. Um, it's, uh, this same invitation is given to us, ladies and gentlemen. The charge is both to receive and to retain the lessons and laws that are given. Look at verse nine. They are a garland of grace. They are a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. People, it is both, there is both a, um, an internal reward and an external reward. Um, both grace, okay, internal reward, 
and a chain to adorn your neck external reward. This is something to be valued. It is something to be sought after. People, we should be seeking wisdom like nothing else. We are to seek after this wisdom that Solomon is speaking about. Seek to embrace it. Look at verse, um, verses 10 through 19. Solomon is going to go on here um, and talk about avoiding the counsel of the ungodly. Avoiding the counsel of the ungodly. Uh, verses 10 through 19. I'm not going to read the whole passage I did earlier, but I do need to point out a few things. Um, my son, if sinful men entice you, do not give in to them. Do not. Solomon's first warning is about the dangers of bad company. The actions of some people clearly reveal them to be sinners more than in the general sense in which we are all sinners. We must resist the enticements of these people. People, there are, there, there's not too many things that is more a powerful force in our lives than the friends we choose, than those we hang around with. Um, it has been said, show me your friends and I can see your future. Okay? It's also been said that we are the sum total of the five, uh, of our five closest friends and family. People, those that we choose to associate with, those that we call friends, those that we take into our circle, have a profound influence on us. Solomon cautions us to be very wary of who we choose to hang with. Verse 10 says, do not give in to them. Notice that Solomon recognizes that one must consent to participate in evil. People, it is our choice. You cannot fall back on the devil made me do it. Okay? You cannot pawn off your responsibility on someone else. It is not culture. It is not society. It is not the law. It is not your ignorance. People, you choose. You choose. We choose. Um, we are responsible. Look at verse 15. My son, do not go along with them. Do not set foot on their path. The only way we can know, um, know that the path is wrong is if we are confident in what the correct path is. How does that happen, ladies and gentlemen? It happens because we know the truth. We know God. We must find his ways so that when alternate truth um, comes, we recognize it for what it is. And that is a lie. Look at verse 19. Such are the paths of all who go after ill-gotten gain. It takes away the life of those who get it. Ladies and gentlemen, verse 19 very clearly tells us that there is always consequences. There is a result when we sin, when we fall away from God, when we forsake God's wisdom, when we forsake God's truth, there are consequences. That consequence, it says here in verse 19, it takes away the life of those who get it. People, it may be slow in coming, but you can be sure that they will come. People, uh, Proverbs 1, look at verse 20. 20 through 32 begins a section where Solomon gives, uh, gives a rebuke, a rebuke. Um, it's actually a call, uh, well, a call to repentance, but he rebukes those who do not seek wisdom. Um, and he presents wisdom as a person. Wisdom takes on a persona of a woman who offers guidance to help the world and is crying aloud. But this cry of wisdom is so often ignored. Look at it. Out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice. This is verse 20. She raises her voice in the public square. On top of the wall, she cries out. At the city gate, she makes her speech. That's verse 20 and 21. She offers her help to anyone who will give attention to her words. 
In verse 22, notice it says, how long? How long will you who are simple love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? Romans 1, 21 through 25 say, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over into the sinful desires of their heart to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, being simple, being uninformed, Lacking wisdom causes us to be naive, gullible, and we follow the lies of the world. In verse 22 that I read, it, how long will you who are simple love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? There's a progression here. It goes from, sim- from being simple to being a mocker to being a fool. From being a simple to being a mocker to being a fool. The mocker thinks they, they know everything. Proverbs 21, 24 um, talks about how they laugh at things that are important. Warren, Warren Worsby also says, fools are people who are ignorant of truth because they're dull and stubborn. Their problem isn't a low IQ or poor education. Their problem is lack of spiritual desire to seek and find God's wisdom. People, as I said earlier, knowledge is at our fingertips. There is more knowledge in this world than than can ever be absorbed by one person. And yet we are so foolish because we have forsaken wisdom. We have forsaken God's wisdom. And we now worship at the knowledge uh, that we find in society. Verse 22 also uses the term, how long, how long? Isaiah 65, two through five says, all day long I have held out my hand to abstinent people who walk in ways not good, pursuing their own imagination, a people who continually provoke me to my very face, offering sacrifices in gardens and burning incense on altars of brick, who sit among the graves and spend their nights keeping secret vigil, who eat the flesh of pigs and whose pots hold broth of impure meat, who say, keep away, don't come near me, for I am too scared for you, too sacred for you, excuse me. Such people are smoke in my nostrils, a fire that keeps burning all day long. Well, how long? Will we continue to turn away from God's truth, away from God's wisdom? How long will he continue to allow it to happen? Look at verse 23. Repent at my rebuke. Proverbs 1, 23. Repent at my rebuke. Then I will pour out my, my thoughts to you. I will make known to you my teaching. People, there is a very clear call here in verse 23 for us to repent of what has has happened, what we have allowed to happen in culture in our own lives. This response of repentance, it says in verse 23, um, actually invites wisdom to pour itself out upon us. Did you see that? Then I will pour out my thoughts to you. People, if we will turn back to God's ways, to God's wisdom, to his insight, the Bible tells us that he will pour out wisdom upon us. The embrace of wisdom, the embrace of God's ways, is to be, begins with a turn. People, one must be willing to change direction from the pursuit of foolishness and turn towards God and his wisdom. Revelation 2.4, turn there, Revelation 2.4. 
This is to the church in Ephesus, to the church in Ephesus, uh, verses 4 and 5. Revelation 2, 4 and 5 says, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. People, the church in Ephesus had forgotten their first love. And I believe we, in today's culture, in today's society, have forgotten God. We have forgotten the truth that God's word holds, the truth, the wisdom that is found only in God. And we seek after other things. Repentance, ladies and gentlemen, requires a change in direction. It is not simply stopping something, but requires us to pick up something else. In this case, it means we must go back to the foundational principles that Solomon spoke about in verse 7. We must return to the fear of the Lord. We must see him. We must see God as high and lifted up. He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the first and the last, the sustainer of life, our Lord and Savior, the sustainer of my soul, our living water, the one who is and was and who is to come, our rock, our fortress, our stronghold, our refuge, our source of strength, our source of all wisdom, of all knowledge, and of all truth. Acts 3.19 says, repent then and turn to God. So that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. People repent and get to know God's truth, his wisdom that is contained in his word. People, we need to start reading God's word as if as if our life depends on it. Because, ladies and gentlemen, it does. This uh this study uh, just raises some passions in me that, uh, that when I look out at this world, I recognize how far we have moved away from God as a society and as a culture and even sometimes as individuals. And, and it makes me want, it brings tears to my eyes, to be honest. People, we've got to get back to the foundational principles of God's word in our own lives first. And then also, um, in our in our cities and in our states and in our country. I'm going to leave you with the challenge to seek God's wisdom first and foremost. Spend time scouring the pages of this book and pray, just as I mentioned earlier from the book of James, pray that God would impart his wisdom upon you and that that wisdom would spread beyond ourselves into the culture in which we live. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to share your word this morning. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be together, though, across many miles. Father, we come together uh, through, through technology to worship and to seek your face, to give you praise, honor, and glory. And Father, to beg you for your wisdom. Father, impart it upon us. Father, help us to devour your word to seek your face and to know your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, next week, uh, Lee should be back with us uh, in continuing his study. Uh, I want to leave you with one, actually two two verses, the very end of chapter, uh, Proverbs chapter one, uh, just as our, our closing verse. Uh, verse is 32 and 33 that say for the waywardness of the simple will kill them and the complacency of fools will destroy them but whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm that's what we're after to live in safety and be at ease without fear or harm. Ladies and gentlemen, it's only going to be found in the Lord. Have a great week. Go out and uh, share the truth of God's word with, word with someone this week as uh, God brings them into your path. Bye, everybody. Mm-hmm.